Hey, I, I need you, if you are a note taker, and even if you're not, I need you to come to life for me right now with a pen and paper in hand, or maybe it's just a mental note, and I need you to write these words, you know, dot, dot, dot. Because this is a little conversation, oftentimes I give an extra greet moment. I'd like you to greet God this morning in a personal moment in your heart. And this is what I, I, you don't need to fill in the dot, dot, dot part because this could be awkward. But I need you to say, God, you know someone I'm really struggling to love this morning. And if that person is next to you, don't write the name down. That'd be really weird. <laughs> But who knows, it could be awesome. But here's what we want to recognize in this world. Now, there, there are people who are easy to love, and there are people, and if we get really gut level honest, there are people it's easy to hate. Let me just bring you an example. So yesterday, I am, um, mom and I got to go on a little excursion yesterday morning, and uh, we're coming back. Uh, from Gorilla Tech, uh, get to take a car in, you know, so we're just cruising back on Northland Drive heading south. And I am second in a lineup of cars. So I am not the lead dog. I am not the pace setter. The car in front of me is. All right? So I can't go beyond them. I'm in the left lane presently. So, okay, two lanes. This individual... <laughs> rides up beside me in the right lane. Now again, I can't go any faster. There is a blocking moment. And this individual looks at me and does this. <laughs> and my response is this. I like, no, there's no fingers involved other than the five, all right? So, be, so I like point forward like, what do you want me to do? You know? But in my moan, I'm like, I can tell you, my heart is not to love that individual. <laughs> my hope is this. And it's wrong. I'm just going to own it. It's wrong. I'm like, please get put behind a slow car. <laughs> please, please catch the light so I can pull up next to you and be like, <laughs> please let there be an officer of the law who says, I would like to talk with you. <laughs> completely in my mind justified because he is a jerk. And so what I need you to do is be honest in your own heart and that you know, because God knows, who is that individual in your heart this morning that says, you know what, God? I don't think they deserve my love. I don't believe they deserve me to give them honor and to give them mercy and to do those things. Because as we consider this morning, we're in a series right now on parables, the stories of a king about his kingdom. We're going to see Jesus giving us a window into his kingdom as he is talking with people here. And I don't know if any of you have ever uh, enjoyed seeing in other people's windows, and if this is something awkward and immoral, then stop it. But when I was a kid, we had a family that lived next door. This is when we lived in St. Charles. Um, and this was the first experience that I had with a divorced family. Jessica, the little girl, lived with her mom next door, and I was amazed. Jessica got everything. She wanted for nothing. She had cable television and would watch Fraggle Rock. Yeah, you know it. I had you there, didn't I? But here's what I also know, and not in a creeper way, but maybe as I describe this, it is a creeper way. So on Christmas morning, from a little window in our home, you could see into their Christmas tree. And I remember watching on a Christmas morning because we had a rule in our house, you couldn't come down until my dad said Merry Christmas. So as you're awaiting that moment, Jessica who wanted for nothing, she could go whenever she wanted. And there was a tree full of awesome. And I remember as a kid being baffled by this fact because Jessica was a girl, but she loved G.I. Joe toys. And I remember seeing her open this massive toy. Again, creepy now that I'm saying it. 
wow. But truth be told, it was a window into her world. And all I saw, though, was the joy and delight of stuff. I had no idea what it's like to live in a home where maybe dad gets bashed by mom every day that she can say bad things about him. Or what it's like to feel like, hey, I can't live with mom and dad under the same roof because it's a broken reality. I don't know what her heart was or what her life was. I just know she got cool stuff. A window, just a peek into the world. And Jesus is giving us a peek into his kingdom as he's here on earth. And we're going to be looking at a text out of Luke chapter 10. Uh, and so as you open your Bibles to Luke chapter 10, it is the story of the Good Samaritan, all right? And again, this is a parable. It's a story that Jesus is going to tell. And each morning, I like to give you a picture of the day, but I need to give you a quick asterisk here. If, if you struggle with the sight of blood... You may need to avert your eyes this morning. All right? This is a selfie. Uh, it is a medical procedure that I get to enjoy on a regular basis, and I'll explain that. But if you have a woozy stomach that you're like, this could throw me off, please, turn away. If you love this... Just own that you're weird. And uh, yes, I see that hand. <laughs> but it, again, it's not anything like, that's it. There's some of you here, like, that's all you built it up to be. Like, oh man, that was weak. But I just don't need anyone passing out, throwing up. If you throw up, just so you know, I will find something else to do than clean it up. That is my mojo. I will find someone else to do it and be like, I didn't even see that. So, uh, so as we get ready for the picture of the day, just be prepared that there is blood, there is a medical, there's medical equipment, and this is my arm. So go ahead, Jen, let's bring this up. So actually, yeah, there we go. So again, yeah, see, there's a gasp. Whew. So I show this picture today with intent. Just so you know, the picture today always has intent. This is me giving blood. I think I, uh, I, I forget which, uh, where I'm at when I did this. I think it might have been either at like Bella Vista Church uh, or uh, maybe Magnify Church at the time. But I show this picture today with this intention. I have to give blood. All right? Some of you in this room are like, man, I love to help other people. So do I. But I have a condition called hereditary hemochromatosis. And that means I have just too much iron in my system. I can't get rid of it on my own. All right? So my body is a hoarder. So like most normal people say, hey, I've taken in all the iron that I need, dump the rest. Mine says, hey, taking in all the iron needs, store the rest. So you are iron. I am Iron Man. <laughs> And here we go. Amen. Let's go home. Thank you. So, as Iron Man, here's what I know. I hear over here, you're iron deficient. If anyone needs A negative blood that is super rich in iron, see me. We should probably do it legally, but... But here's what I know. So what I have is I have this condition that says, Josh, Really all you need to do is give blood because the body is smart enough to know that when I have a pint of blood taken out, the body says, let's rebuild the blood. And so it goes looking for iron to rebuild blood. So I basically trick my body to stop hoarding and to start building. And if I stop donating blood, then what happens is I just store it up, store it up, store it up to the point that it will shut down most likely my liver. All right, that's, where, that's how I found out I had it. I had an issue with my liver, and uh, we got a biopsy. If you never had a biopsy, don't, if you don't need to. <laughs> but I show that picture because of this. If any of you have ever donated blood, there is a whole host of questions that you have to say yes or no to prior to that donation. And some of them are really odd. But one of the questions that it asks is, is have you been in contact with someone else's blood? Have you been in contact with someone else's blood? Because that can disqualify me from giving. 
And so I am very weirdly cautious of what I come in contact with. Yesterday, Grayson was at a volleyball match. He got cut. I got him Band-Aids. He goes to like do the Band-Aids. Terry's like, you can take care of those? I'm like, not if I don't have to. Because in my head, even though he's my kid, I'm like, I don't want to touch his blood. Because if they ask me and I say, yes, I have been in contact with someone else's blood, it hinders what I need. And I share that story with this morning because you know what? Loving people costs something. When you get into someone else's life, it's messy, could be bloody, as we'll see in the story, and it may hinder you from what you need. And that's how Jesus says, hey, in my kingdom, I want to show you what it's like to love people. To love even when it costs you something. So as we st step into the story, uh, we're going to look at this from Luke chapter 10. So just follow along as we uh, read this out, and then we're going to break it down. It says this, Luke 10, uh, we'll begin actually verse 25. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus, the master, master teacher, Jesus replies, what is written in the law, he replied. How do you read it? The lawyer answers, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. Or with all your strength and all your mind. We just sang that. And love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus replies, you've answered correctly. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify him. The lawyer wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead, bloody. A priest happened to be going down the same road. When he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So to a Levite, when he came to the place and saw the man, he passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him, and he bandaged his wounds. Let me tell you, that's messy. That will disqualify him potentially from giving blood. <laughs> Pouring on oil and wine, and he put the man on his own donkey and brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper and said, look after him. He said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expenses you may have. And then Jesus went on to say, uh, and so who is the neighbor? Look at verse 37. And the expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. Go and do likewise. So as we consider that parable, as I was reading this week, that is probably, they said, one of the most common parables that people know. Probably one of the most familiar stories. Actually, I can, in my mind, I can remember back to our church growing up. This was a little picture book that we had. All right? The story of the Good Samaritan. And, uh, and so as I read through that, you know, even kids are aware of this. And we, people hear the term, oh, that's a Good Samaritan. It all stems from this story. But what I want to do is blow up your mind this morning with this. So what is that telling us about the kingdom? What does the king want us to know about that? Because as I was reading this week, I found that there's a whole lot more to it than meets the eye. So as we think, I have three points that I want you to consider this morning. And the first is just super simple. And that is this. Be in awe of King Jesus. So we know the name Jesus. We read the stories of Jesus. Jesus walked on the earth for about 33 years, we believe, before he was crucified, was buried, rose again, and then spent some time before going back to heaven. Jesus is a historical figure, and there in this world are varying ideas of who and what Jesus should be in your life. I want to challenge you this morning to be in awe of the king. He's the king. It's his kingdom. So let me ask you this. When you think Jesus, do you step back and let your jaw drop? Or are you just more like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm? 
I know. That is all about Jesus, that's good stuff. Or do you step back and say, Jesus, wow, that's amazing. Because I have a few uh, abide journal connections out of Matthew 22. I shared this with a community group uh, last week. In Matthew 22, we're going to see three statements that I just want you to just stop and ponder as we consider, are you in awe of the king? Because he's the one who calls the shots. Verse 22 of Matthew 22. After Jesus had silenced some people asking him hard questions, says, when they heard this, they were amazed. Amazed. Like when you read through scriptures and you read through Jesus' stuff, are you like, wow, that was awesome. I can shut my Bible right now and just be filled for the day. Because that's what these folks were. They were amazed, and so he left them and went away. Verse 33 in that same chapter. When the crowds heard this, they were astonished at his teaching. Astonished. Is that how you see Jesus' teachings? Does it blow your mind, completely rattle who you are? Or are you like, I got it. I'm good. I know that. And then verse 46. After Jesus does this masterful teaching time, and everyone's been asking him these hard questions, and he's turned it on its head every time. It says, no one could say a word in reply. And from that day, and from that day on, no one dared to ask him any more questions. They're like, we can't do it. Every time we think we've got him stumped, he just shuts us down. He is amazing. That is who our Jesus is. And that doesn't even deal with the cool stuff he did. That doesn't deal with the healings. That doesn't deal with the things where he cast out demons. That doesn't deal with the fact that he rose from the dead. Man, this is just how he handled himself as he taught about the kingdom. Amazed. The old uh, song, I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene. If that is not where your heart is at with Jesus today, let me encourage you. Ask Jesus why. Say, why am I not blown away by who you are? Because it's not because he has changed. It's not a him thing. It's an us thing. And so this morning as we stand in awe of King Jesus, let me bring forward why that is important in this storyline. Because see, the parable of Good Samaritan is not simply about how you show kindness and mercy to someone else. That is a nice reality. But standing in awe of King Jesus is where it all begins. Look back, Luke 10, verse 25. And on occasion, an expert of the law stood up to do what? What was he doing here? Just yell it out. To test Jesus. He was not asking this question with genuine intent. He was here to mock. He was here to try and stump Jesus. He was here to make our king look bad. And ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you something. That is shameful. Our king is not one to be uh, you know, trifled with. He's not someone that anyone else can put behind any of their own setup. But this guy thinks he's better than Jesus. He thinks, hey, I am really what life is about, so let me put Jesus in a box. Let me get him a question that he can't answer. That is not awe. That is pride. That is arrogance. And so this guy comes in an arrogant way. It's not a, don't read this and think, oh, this is such a nice guy just trying to figure out how to do life. He is coming to try and make Jesus look embarrassed. And I love this about Jesus. It never works. It never works. There is never a time in Jesus' ministry that you see him being like, dang it, he got me. I didn't see that one coming. Jesus is always, hey, I am a master teacher. But this man in arrogance and pride comes to say, let me test you. And so he says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And I love how Jesus deals with him. This is a lawyer. This is someone who does life in the legal world. And again, he's probably a religious lawyer, so he's in the nuances of what does the law say? What should you do? Very pharisaical. And so Jesus says, what's written in the law? How do you read it? He says, let, 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 me, let me ask you. So what does it say? And this man replies with this beautiful answer. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all your strength and all your mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. And so that is this powerful answer. And don't ever read this next statement as if this is something we can do. You've answered correctly. Jesus says, do this and you will live. If you can do that perfectly, then you've done it. 
But Jesus knew this, nobody does it perfectly. Everyone falls short. For all have sinned and fall short. All have sinned. So Jesus is not giving a little backdoor aspect here to say like, well, if you can earn your way in, you're, you've got it. Jesus says, hey, that standard is so high you'll never make it. But look at this guy. He's driving in the right-hand lane, giving Jesus the, what are you going to do now look? <laughs> he says, all right. You've answered correctly. Do this and you'll live. But he wanted to justify. The only one who can justify is Jesus. But this man says, let me justify myself. Let me make myself look good. I am way better than anybody in this crowd right now. I am, Jesus, you should be impressed by me. You should be in awe of me. So wanting to justify himself, he says, who is my neighbor? Because as I was reading this week, the Jewish world operated under this reality. Love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Jesus actually calls that out in Matthew chapter 5. See, in the Jewish world, it was about who you defined as neighbor. I will love my neighbor if I define them and def uh, deem them worthy of me. If I deem them a neighbor, then I can love them. If I deem them an enemy, I can hate them. And I feel good about who I am. Jesus is going to call him out to say, no. You and your own self-justification think that you define the terms. In my kingdom, I define the terms. It is my kingdom, and you are my citizens if you follow me. And if you don't follow me, you're not part of my kingdom. Jesus is the man. He is deity. He is God-man. He is awesome. And so today as we start, catch this first part of the parables is leading in with this. This man did not stand in awe of Jesus. He did not look at him as the king. He looked at him as someone he didn't trust, didn't want to follow, and really thought he himself was the one who was the king of his own life. We don't like that in other people. But let's be honest. There are parts of our world we want to be kings and queens of. We want to be kings and queens of our time and our money and who we think is worthy of us. As I'm driving down Northland Drive, I can tell you this. I did not want good for that man. He was not worthy of my love and respect. He was worth my scorning look, just like this guy came at Jesus and says, hey, let me show you who's boss. That's what I wanted in my heart. And Jesus says, Josh, hear me. You're wrong. And as I was in my office this morning and I'm getting ready today, I'm like, whoa, Jesus, I've got some ugly in me. I've got some ugly that I don't want to admit, but as I spend time with you, I am more like this legal guy than I'd ever want to think. I have some stuff that i got to get rid of. Because the king says that doesn't work in my kingdom. So let's begin just saying, uh, let's just honor the king. Be in awe in who is Jesus. The second part I want you to see this morning is this. Delight in the king's word. Here, Grace, we really want to encourage our folks to be uh, reading through scripture on a regular basis. We really would like to do it together. So we have the Abide Journal. And some people buck against that. Some people are like, not a big deal about that. Some people love it. I don't know where you're at, but I just encourage you to say, hey, if you're not doing it, give it a whirl. I think it's worth your time. Because then we can talk, Jesus talk together. But whatever the case is, Jesus, in this moment, is going to call him out. He says, hey, how do you read the scriptures? How do you go back to my manual and read what's going on? Jesus didn't give us the word of God for just kicks and uh, our own like devices. They're like, oh, neat. I can memorize scriptures so I can get candy at Awana. That's all good. But he gave us the scriptures to show us how to live in his kingdom. Look at this. Psalm 1, 1 through 3. This is a little psalm that uh, our boys memorized in like pre-K school back in the state of Illinois. And if corrupt Illinois can get it right, so can we. Psalm, that, 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 that's probably low-hanging fruit, sorry. We had a great time there. Good people there. 
Yeah, exactly. Oh, shoot. I am Iron Man. Oh, wait. There, there, there. I just had to bring myself around. But listen to this. Psalm 1. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked, or stand in the way of sinners, or sit in the company of mockers. But hear this beautiful statement in verse 2. But whose delight, whose joy, who, who finds it to be truly mm, so good is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither and whatever they do prospers. So the word of God is integral in the heart and lives of the king. It is integral in the heart and lives of his people. So if you want to know how to do kingdom life here in this world, get in and delight in God's word. Look at Joshua chapter 1, verse 7 and 8. As Joshua's coming to the helm of leadership for the nation of Israel, Moses is passing from the scene, the one that was supposed to be the great uh, leader into the promised land. He's going to not make it because he chose not to obey what Jesus said, God said. But Joshua gets to lead those folks in. And Moses says to him, be strong and very courageous. Actually, this is God speaking to him. Be careful to obey all the law of my servant Moses that he gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left. There you may be successful wherever you go. Keep the book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. And hear me this morning. I am not promoting a health and wealth philosophy here. I'm not telling you if you delight in God's word that everything is going to go peachy keen in this world. And I don't even know what that title means. But what I can tell you is this. You follow Jesus and life will be hard. I can guarantee it. But he says, but I will walk with you through it. And I will lead you through it. And I will show you from my word how to do life in my kingdom. And so we see that because Hebrews 4.12 says, for the word of God is alive and active. The, the scriptures are not a just manual of like how to's of like, all right, that's dry bones. No, it's living. It tells you how to do life. It tells you how to do life here on March 12th, 2023. It is alive today just as it was when the uh, legal guy was reading it 2,000 years ago. He says, sharper than a two-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing the soul and the spirit. Joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and intentions of the heart. God's word is powerful. And Jesus says to this man, he says, hey, how do you read this? How do you hear this uh, from scripture? And so as he goes through, Jesus says, hey, I want to do more than just teach you a moral lesson. I want you to teach you how to live in my kingdom. So he tells the story. The story was fresh to the ears of the lawyer. But for us, we've heard it many times. And when I want to say delight in God's word, can I just encourage you with something? If you ever come to scripture and be like this, I know that. I got this. I can tell you that backwards and forwards. Then stop yourself there and say, Jesus, what do you want to teach me today? It's not going to be something like new truth, like, wow, I've never, that no one has ever seen this before, but maybe for your heart it's new truth. Maybe you're sitting in your office one day on a Sunday morning getting ready to preach about loving your neighbor and Jesus says, hey, I'm going to teach you something from a story you've heard since birth. And you know what, Josh? You need to hear that loud and clear today. You've got to get rid of that ugly. You've got to stop justifying thinking, hey, I'm better than the dude in the car. And I can tell you something. I can justify all kinds of ways. I can be angry at the dad who's two seats down from me cheering for his son at a volleyball game when he's beating my son or vice versa. And I'm like, ooh, you're my enemy. I can tell you this. Sometimes when Tara and I can go head to head at something, I can be like, dude, you're my enemy. <coughs> I can say here when we work across the hall, if something goes sideways, I can be, Kevin, you're my enemy. I will never verbalize that. I'm not dumb. <laughs> yeah, it is true. But truth be told, in my heart, I can sink in and say, you know what? I am just, I am better here. I'm the one who makes the shots. And King Jesus says, no, actually you're not. That's right. King Jesus says, actually, Josh, you got, the, you got the crud. You got the stuff that, you, I, you know, you've got the blood of something that's infected. And yet the king says, I'll come to you. I'll be merciful to you. And he says, in my kingdom, this is how my people do it. So again, hear the story once again with fresh ears. 
don't be like, that's a kid's story. Don't think it's just a moral lesson. But what does the king say? In reply, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. Jericho walls are breaking. That, that was good. Uh, when, we, when he was attacked by robbers, they stripped him of his clothes. They beat him, went away, leaving him half dead. And a priest happened to be going down the same road. And when he saw the man, he passed on the other side. And so to a Levite, and again, you got to understand, Jesus is talking to a Jewish audience. They understood all these roles. The priest was the one who was supposed to be the mediator between God and man. The Levite was working in the temple. They should have been the ones that modeled God to this world. But they just passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, and he, when you have to understand something, this is like walking into the big house at U of M and saying, go Spartans. This is like living in the great state of Michigan and saying, go Ohio State. See, I just threw up in my mouth. And uh, <laughs> this is pure ugly to the audience. As soon as Jesus says, put a Samaritan, they're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Uh -uh. You had me at the first two, but not anymore. But Jesus says, no. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, he came to where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. And he went to him, and he bandaged his wounds, and pouring out oil and wine, and pouring on him oil and wine. And then he put the man on his own donkey, and brought him to an inn, to take, and took care of him. And the next day, he, gave, he uh, took out two denarii. Two denarii are basically two days' worth of wage. So whatever you make in two days, that's what he put on the table and said, hey, take this. Pay for all the expenses. And then he gave this little statement. Look after him. And when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expenses you may have. If this doesn't cover it, I'll come back. Jesus says, hey, hear my words. And so this morning, as we delight in God's word, let me just bring to you this fact that this is not just a kid's story. This is for you and I today. This is for you and I today to say, hey, as the king shows us how to do life in his kingdom, this is how. This is how. And you're like, well, Josh, what does that look like? Great question. He's going to tell this lawyer to go and do likewise. And so that's my word to you this morning. I have a few points for you to consider here. Oh boy, we're, we will sing, but let me run. First of all, I want you to be honest with yourself. Again, I hope you didn't write anyone's name down that you said, yeah, that's the person I hate. But I need you to be honest with yourself. When you think, hey, Jesus, you actually got a good catch with me. He didn't. But he loved you anyways. He loved me anyways. <laughs> Titus, right, or Paul writes to Titus in Titus 3. He says, At one time, you too were foolish, disobedient, deceived, and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. He says, You did not bring anything to the table. Actually, you lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. Train wreck. Not a good train wreck. But when the kindness and love of our God and Savior appeared, he saved us. Not because of the righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, through whom he has poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that having been justified, not by who I am, but justified by his grace, we might become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. That's honesty. That's saying, hey, Jesus, when I come to you, I really have nothing to bring. And when I look down on someone else, that is completely wrong because I am one of those someone else's. So be honest. We're not justified by who we are. We're justified by what he did. But as we do go to do likewise, we don't simply be honest. We need to be aware. Don't walk through this life with blinders thinking that there's not hurting people all around you. There are not people in the thicks of the being beaten and stripped and bloodied and bruised that are all around you. And it may not look physical. It may be emotional. It may be social. It may be economical. But you've got a bunch of people around you that need you. And you're not better than them. And then, please, take the next step. Don't simply say, okay, I get it, Jesus. I, I was a train wreck. You saved me. I see that there are people around. Now be compassionate. Romans 12, 15 says, rejoice with those who rejoice. We love that part. When people are cheering and it's all going great, we love that. But then Paul says, and also mourn with those who mourn. 
find where people are hurting and step into that. Not simply to be nice, but to model the king. And how does he do it? Look at this last statement, to be merciful. Jesus writes this, in, or says this in Luke 12, or 6. But to you who are listening, I say, love your enemies. Love the dude on Northland Drive. Love the dad who's cheering against your son. Love the person who completely uh, jilted you when you didn't deserve it. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. If someone slaps you on one cheek, now get real with Jesus. If someone slaps you on one cheek, turn them the other also. No way, not in my way. You're not better than Jesus, so stop telling him he's wrong. If someone asks you for your coat, don't withhold it. Uh, withhold from them your shirt either. Give to anyone who asks you. And, uh, and if anyone takes what belongs to you, don't demand it back. This is kingdom life, people. Do to others what you'd have them do to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Man, that's street-level talk right there. That, that cuts to the heart. Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. And if you lend to those who you can expect to be repayment, or get, expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners, accepting to be repaid in full. But love your enemies, do good to them, and lend to them without expecting anything in return. That seems unwise. Jesus says, hey, don't base it on who you think you are and that you're better than me. Base it on what I'm telling you and my kingdom work is about, and what it's about. Love your enemies. Then your reward will be great, and you'll be called children of the Most High because he is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. Be merciful just as your Father is merciful. Go and do likewise. And as you read through that, this guy named Al Moeller, who is a big uh, shot in the Southern Baptist Convention, he might be president of that convention or whatever, he says this, Jesus was making a comprehensive theological point when he tells this story. We are to consider all humans as our neighbor. There is not a single human being made in God's image who does not deserve our compassion, care, and mercy. The example of the Samaritan grabs our attention and renders us powerless to come up with any exception to those who deserve our mercy. So this morning, let me ask you this question. This story is not simply about doing nice things for people. That is the outcome of it, yes. That's a, that's a good thing. But the reality is this. How is your heart with the king? Do you stand in awe of him? Do you delight in what he says? And then do you act and do what the king says? And so as you're considering that, let me give you three action steps. The first is to get to know the king. Get to know King Jesus. Not who you think Jesus is. Get to know the biblical king, Jesus, who says, Hey, I have a kingdom. I am the king. And I want to invite you into it. I want you to know, though, my kingdom is not what you think it's going to be. It's way better. It's way better. Get to know King Jesus. And if you're here this morning and say, hey, You know what? I don't know Jesus. I've heard about him. I, I know some stuff about it, but I really don't know Jesus. Let today be the day. Come to know the king. Second thing, get into the king's word. If you are not reading the scriptures on a regular basis, I'm not trying to give you a checklist to do. I'm just saying, the king gave you a manual that says, hey, this is kingdom life. You need to know it. You need to delight in it. If you need help with that, we would love to walk beside you in that. And then the last piece has two caveats to it. It says, get your heart and your life aligned with the first thing, who the king is. Who is King Jesus? How does he do it? Because you know what? He stepped across the road to save you. He stepped across the road to save me. You know what? He understands what it is to be bloody and bruised and things like that because that happened to him on the cross. He died a literal death, was buried, rose again so that you and I can have life. And that is what he says, hey, this is who I am. This is what I call you to do. So get to know who the king is and align your heart and life with that. And then align yourself with what the king says. Go and do likewise. Go and do likewise.